offshore in California. You right. talked for a minute about uh, the, the, the tragedy with the BP blowout in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, being from Texas, let's talk a little bit about the Gulf of Mexico, if, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, the U.S. oil companies aren't the only ones drilling in the Gulf of Mexico, are they? You know, I don't believe so, but I have to be honest with you. Our purview includes right. only the Western United okay. States. I'm not familiar with who's uh, operating uh, in the Gulf of uh, Mexico, I believe. Uh, you know, it, I, as, I as I, a lawyer, I don't ask a question yeah, I don't right. know the answer to. <laughs> and you've actually got uh, the China drilling off the coast right. of Cuba. You've got the state oil company in Mexico that's drilling in the Gulf of Mexico as well. So in the, regardless of what amount of regulation we put on our domestic oil companies, we're not going to have any effect on what uh, China and Mexico are doing. We can't change the way they drill. Is that would that be an accurate statement? Uh, I think, think that's that's that? correct, sir. I mean, I think the, the the chairman mentioned too that, you know, while we are seeing the prices at these very high levels apparently related to the unrest in the Middle East, the longer term picture is the not just you know the their these other emerging economies right. are very actively and aggressively out in the world market looking for um, produ new production opportunities. Right. They're buying a tremendous amount of oil and it's creating so upward pressure. Do you think pressure. a better regulatory scheme or better way for the taxpayers to spend their money rather than making it more difficult for y'all to drill in the Gulf and, and compete and make you know, permitting and all these regulations might be to uh, invest a little bit of time and money in some response uh, training and technology. So in the event something happened in a, in a uh, well owned by a, or operated by another country, uh, we'd be able to respond to that as well as if something happened uh, locally. I lost the question. I apologize. Uh, no, it, rather than <laughs> putting excessive regulation on our domestic companies, making it right. more difficult for them to compete, let's say in the Gulf of Mexico, and where you've got Mexico and China also drilling. If something happens on a Mexican or a Chinese uh, drilling rig and there's a, a, a blowout or a leak or something, wouldn't we better off, rather than spending our time and effort regulating domestic companies, coming up with responses that would benefit any worldwide uh, oil company well, training and, I, and technology. I think the U.S. oil and gas industry have, has led the world in developing those kinds of responses. In California, of course, we have a huge uh, resources on standby 24-7 to respond and have developed, along with other regions of the country, this technology that really is used worldwide to uh, respond to any accidents that occur. Right, well, I, I'm over time. I'll let everybody else get their turns, but I would like well, another we, round of questions. I, I assure you we will, as long as our witnesses are willing to indulge us, we would like to learn all we can. Mr. McCarthy. Well, I, I thank all the witnesses for their testimony, and it really comes down to why we're having the hearing, why we're having this challenge. We use more energy than we produce in this country. Having said that, that means we have to get it from somewhere else. So we pay for it somewhere else. The challenge that I've always faced in this job is there's many times we think in California we realize other states compete with us. We had the ability to say which state produces more than others. We watch every day maybe a company leave California somewhere else because they maybe give a little better price. We never really think that America competes with other countries, but we do. And energy is probably the number one industry that you can find that to happen. If we make it harder here, we will still buy it somewhere else. Now, this country has faced a lot of challenges. And normally, when we face a challenge, we meet a goal and we go forward. We've, we've done that in World War II. We achieved our goal. When we found it that uh, Russia went to space first, we made a goal for us that in a decade we were going to go to the moon. And we faced our attention on that. For too long in energy, we only face our attention when the problem gets too big and that we'll put our attention there, then we forget about it when it comes down so you don't have the ability to go there. If anybody's ever lived in a community that has oil, you've seen the booms and the bust. If you lived in this community, you watched a time where the cost to lift it was more than the barrel you could even sell it for, but you could not shut it down, so you had to maintain it. Um, I, I have found that the country gets very divided. Now, a time that we all get united is usually during the Olympics. Why? Because we cheer for our country. We never ask them whether they're Republican or Democrat. But the other reason why we cheer so strong is because America gets a level playing field. 
If we do a 100-yard dash, we all start at the same starting line, and we all have the same finishing line. So we've got to think from that mindset, too. When we make stuff more difficult here, someone else can still be drilling someplace else but have different protections on the coast than we would have. Um, and so taking some of that, I thought some of this, um, some of this ability of what I was, saw here today, I, I loved the presentation where you actually shown how it was going. Now, technology has changed, and probably the best analogy I've heard from somebody, if you think of a bathtub and you fill it with water, picture that underground that that's a natural resource. Our old way of doing it was putting a lot of straws into the bathtub and trying to get that water out. Horizontal is fundamentally different. Now we get to just go to the drain and use one. So that's one over the land, and that's one ability to bring it up in a, in a different capacity, and it's environmentally safer. When oil was first discovered in Kern County, it was out in Taft, it was a lake. There's pictures of people in a boat, not of water, but of oil. It's a fundamental different place of where we have it now and how our protections. But I want to take that technology a little further, and I want to follow up with Mr. Whitsitt. When you do the fracking, you had shown in your graph, because there has been some people bring up the issue about the water table and the protection. If you can walk me through that one more time to show where fracking goes and where the water table is and what protections we have in going using the technology. Great question, Congressman. Um, water tables or, or the aquifers that uh, are drinkable are essentially shallow and uh, with very few exceptions, as I indicated, a few hundred feet below the surface. The states require, and we with our practices um, implement a very strict regimen of sealing off those water sources at the surface or close to the surface with multiple layers of steel and cement. And then the frack job is done through those layers that, that seal off the, uh, the water. And when you, when you normally do the fracking, how further down is that from the water table itself? Thousands of feet in most cases. Certainly 15,000 feet is, is not uncommon. Um, we at Devon are doing 8 to 10 to 12,000 feet, and so you're, you're well below, far below the uh, uh, water sources. In Canada, I will mention too, and this goes to other things we're doing to try to protect both water quality and, and, um, and quantity and quality, uh, we actually, in our heavy oil operations in Canada, have found ways to use non-potable water. So we use no fresh water to generate steam. And we're trying to find areas where we can do things like that all the time because we are very much in tune with concerns that are very legitimate, particularly in the West, about water issues. We also try recycling where we can. We do it where we can. And we also blend water, so we use flowback water to put in the next job if we're able to do that. And we're making progress on that technology all the time as well. Now, we all, we all know that one form of energy is not going to get us out. We also know that um, as advancements go, we will have renewables that have great potential for the future. But we need that bridge. The challenge that we have is that we have to have a policy that allows us with the ebbs and flows of the cost to actually bring the cost down because our economy, 70 percent of it is based on consumption. With the price of oil rising so rapidly, what happens is people are still paying that cost the business and they're taking the consumption out of the economy so our economy drops. But that, that price still goes someplace else and it goes out to another economy. So Rock, you brought up inside talking about the taxes, that they are very similar in the same taxes based upon any other business. I wish if you could explain that um, a little further. Well, um, there's been a lot of discussion about um, whether or not oil companies receive subsidies. And I was trying to make the distinction between a subsidy and a tax treatment. In fact, um, first of all, the actual components that are within the administration's budget that they want to eliminate uh, target independent producers, not major oil. So that's the first distinction. Most of those tax treatments are not available to the major integrated oil companies. They're only for the independents. But the second and more important point that I was trying to make is, you know, a subsidy is a cash payment from the government for doing some sort of activity. It's quite different if you're having 
uh, a debate within the IRS about how to treat a certain expense, and we'd be happy to have that debate. But keep in mind, the only way that you have this debate and the only way that you have these expenses is if you're deploying capital. And that's exactly what our companies are doing, is they're deploying capital. And the question is, how best can they redeploy the new capital? And that's what a lot of these tax treatments were designed for. Given the fact that this is highly risky, it's very expensive, and our energy security depends on it, the taxes in the teens and 20s 100 years ago were designed in order to uh, encourage the rapid reinvestment of this capital back into new oil and drilling programs, and that's exactly what we experience. So you, if you do not invest the risk, you cannot get the tax? That's correct. Um, can I just add one point here, please? Uh, yes. Just inject for, for Devon, and we are a large independent uh, exploration production company. The recent proposals by the administration just on the intangible drilling costs, which are the real cost, as Rock has pointed out, of drilling a well. It's clearing the land, doing the environmental remediation. If those proposals were put in place, it would cost Devon about a billion dollars in the first year. And that would equate to our complete drilling program in the Barnett Shale that I mentioned was where the shale revolution really started, and it's the most prolific area in the country. To us, we have to say, what is that all about? That looks to us like it is totally a wrongheaded policy that actually would penalize the companies that are most efficient at producing domestic resources that power this nation. Uh, I want to go to Assemblywoman Grove because she, she has witnessed um, one in kind of all your presentations from the redundancy of regulation, not just with oil, with renewables trying to find from wind and solar out in the East Kern, but from our own personal in a business, finding out because of what California does, where you're setting a business in another state. But I wonder if you could touch on, one, the redundancy, the, what you are viewing outside in the district as well for the, our ability to produce more energy uh, in America. Thank you. Um, if, if all due respect, I'd like to address just one thing prior to, you know, we talked about taxes or a tax uh, that you guys were just addressing. Um, Industry, meaning the oil industry, pays an average of 41.4 percent of tax. Um, and if California liberal politicians have their way, what we're fighting up in that building right now, and they get a 12.5 percent oil severance tax, it'll increase the industry's tax to 53.9 percent. Now, to give that number some perspective, if you take Apple in 2010, they paid 28 percent of its revenue or profit to the government. Apple did. Um, while it generated more profits than Chevron. So in perspective, industry is being punished on a tax base and, um, than, other, than other employment agents or industries. And when, if you go back to Mr. Chair, you had a question earlier about um, the average products of good and profit, and those of us that have been business know that, you know, somebody could say, well, you run a $25 million a year corporation, but after you pay payroll taxes, workers' comp liability insurance, and you go down to the net profit, it's hundreds of, it's less, it's around $100,000, not in the millions. So if you take Apple, for instance, again, in a comparison, the average products sold are about 25% above the cost of materials and production for marketing and sales. And then if you use that for the same in comparison to with Exxon, Exxon's profit margins in comparison were about 8.7 percent, and that's hardly the windfall that people are proclaiming. Um, if you take the oil industry as a whole, they have 11.5 um, percent basic on profits and making that 45th most profitable industry of the year. That is hardly close to the top 10. So just to clarify those two things. And then back to your question, Mr. McCarthy, I'm sorry. Um, you know, from a business standpoint, being a third, sometimes fourth tier contractor for the oil industry, the job multiplier that we have, and I ran on jobs, you know, we have 2.5 million people unemployed in the state of California, which affects our federal um, revenue as well. And um, when I ran on jobs, and you look at what industry can place um, in these jobs, um, you talk about the job multiplier. A lot of the individuals in this testimony have referenced the oil industry jobs. Um, and I'm going to name a few local companies. If you, uh, if you take one oil field job and a platform, you have engineers that, yes, and you have site engineers, you have chemical engineers, you have mechanical engineers, you have people that um, are a job multiplier is what I call them. If you build a site, you have an excavation crew, a site crew, a gravel crew. 
the gravel is produced someplace, mainly in one of the facilities that we have either on the Grapevine or, or in Mojave. You have uh, trucking companies that transport that gravel to the site. You have um, everything from all those companies that are supported are supported by oil or big oil, small oil, independent oil. These are small businesses that thrive on this industry. You have um, people that supply more paper and pencils and product like from Stinson's or O'Leary's. You got simple things like Mona at Speedway Market where 90% of the people that go to work in the oil field stop and purchase stuff from her for their daily consumption of food and breakfast. So when you look at the small business that thrives on this industry, the jobs that are created and not created from private business because of the limitations with permit delays um, through the Division of Oil and Gas, or I've seen projects delayed out in the oil industry where a blunt-nosed leopard lizard is on site and they caution tape it off and everybody sits around and waits for this lizard to leave. You talk about, um, Mr. Layton talked about a description of a job that's being delayed um, where the activity of this blunt-nosed lizard is in certain times of the year so you just have to stop working until this lizard finds its way to another location or goes into some type of hibernation. Um, those things don't make any sense. Um, when it comes to job creation. The oil industry and, and, and job creators are very conscious of things that need to be done to protect our environment and our land. But California and Department of Fish and Game and federal EPA is way overreaching and have become completely unreasonable to the hindrance or full out assault against private sector job creation. Assemblywoman, if I could follow up on that. Is there really any difference in your estimation between the crazy or the excesses you're describing in oil and the same excesses that are occurring that are delaying green energy rollout? Because this is also an area of the state that has the potential to provide an awful lot of solar and other energy. Don't you find the same thing to be true, that, that the same self-inflicted wounds are hurting our ability to reach any reasonable goal of renewables? It's exactly true, um, and it's not only in renewable and energy. You take um, in East Kern, which I represent as well, there was a solar plant that wanted to put a um, solar facility in the Mojave Desert where the sun is, and it was, uh, it was not able to do that because of a Mojave ground squirrel. You look at um, industry, just private business industry across from development. I have a, a developer in Taft who's had a certain piece of property who cannot develop that property and provide a, affordable housing in Taft where we have a large oil uh, uh, production area um, because of squirrels that live on that property. And he has to tag them and put a little antenna on them and transfer them to, you know, double the amount of property. It's so the environment. We saw all that on Animal Planet. It was very impressive, <laughs> the, the tracking. Welcome just to not very productive for mankind, I guess. In this it, is, it is not, and not productive for um, job creation in our state and in our nation. Um, you know, I recently had the opportunity to go to Texas, and uh, it was uh, very interesting. And see the governor, I understand. I did. I got to meet Governor Perry. And what was interesting is that we talked to uh, the Department of Railroad oversees their permit process in Texas for some, uh, I'm not really sure about that because the railroad and the permit process. And um, keeping the same environmentally protections, protecting our land and being conscious of our planet, um, they issue permits within two to five days, project permits, where we're sometimes delayed for um, up to years. That and then the environmental delays with species, endangered species on these proper projects and properties causes jobs that we desperately need um, here in our state and our nation to be delayed as well. Rock, you. You, you said something, and I want to try to put it in the record in a way that people that are not involved in the oil industry would understand. Uh, I, you know, I came from the electronics industry. We watched the government come up with this interesting one that our patents, if we had a patent and we went through and we paid the legal fees, we had to amortize the patent over the life of the patent, all the costs we paid to the lawyers. So you pay the lawyers today, you finally get your patent. And by the way, if they turn down the patent, you could write it off. But if you actually had something worthwhile, so you, you, you got it, you had to amortize all. Then if you had to sue somebody to defend your patent, you had to put all of that into, if you will, a long-term depreciation schedule because the government wanted your profits today even if you had spent them in trying to create profits for the future. Isn't that basically the same kind of wrong-minded thinking that American companies are seeing, except in your case, 
It's a drill bit that when you dull the drill bit and you break a bunch of equipment as you're drilling down and you set it aside, you send it off to salvage, it's gone, you've spent, you bought it, you paid for it, you spent it, and you disposed of it. They now want you to amortize that over the useful life of the oil well. Isn't that essentially what, because you say intangible, and to me, money out of my pocket that I know I spent, that they want me to pretend I didn't spend for 20 years, that's not intangible. Is that the intangible we're talking about here today? That's exactly right. Uh, we're talking about mud, cement, testing, uh, some drilling operations that you're talking about, all things that are happening before a well is completed or any production has come online. You know, what's amazing is uh, America is a funny place. We, we talk about how we support business, we re really care about it, but people in Washington, in my, my position, have done some amazing things. I was in private business when NAFTA was passed, and whether you're whether you for or against NAFTA, one day I found out NAFTA had been signed, and I found out as a result of NAFTA I was going to have to wire transfer weekly my payroll withholding taxes instead of sending in a check. And the reason was because your predecessor, Bill Thomas, and all the other guys, they had a couple of billion they needed in revenue to make NAFTA pencil out. So they got it by accelerating the speed with which every business in America would send money to the government. Now, it only scores a one-time event because they've just accelerated the speed which they got it from a couple of weeks or a quarter for small companies to immediate. We're still doing that today, and it's one of the frustrations I have. I want your industry to expense everything, absolutely, that is consumed. I certainly want you to capitalize your long-term assets. If you've got a casing there, it's reasonable to have it over the life. But I want your capital to be put back to work as quickly as possible. Uh, I want uh, Devon en Energy to have a smaller bank line or put in more wells. And the amazing thing is I can't get my government to go along, and I can't even get the Ways and Means Committee to go along. But let me go to another question that I wanted to understand, because fracking, which is not new technology, isn't what we're talking about here today. What we're talking about is better fracking. Is that right? That's correct, and new applications of fracking. And if I understood correctly, if we're concerned about the watershed, we've been concerned about it for 60 years, because you've been fracking for 60 years. Correct. And we've sort of, we should know, we shouldn't need uh, Secretary Chu to endlessly study something you've been doing for 60 years. Let me understand something. When you go down once, but you go far further as far as what you yield, the only difference in that, that is that you only have one area of risk, which is that casing, for a far greater gain. Is that correct? The casing is, is placed for a couple of reasons. The, the one that we've been talking about, obviously, is to protect the water sources. That's, that's primary, and it happens in every well. Um, there are other applications of casing to prevent the, the hole from collapsing and, and those kinds of things. But the fact is, and what I think you're alluding to, is that we've been doing this for a long time. The technology gets better. The materials get stronger. The knowledge of how we do this and how many times we do it along that horizontal um, uh, length of pipe it all improves, and we are seeing remarkable efficiency gains. And one more thing that, that is really remarkable today is we're doing much more of what we call pad drilling, where we can actually do these multiple horizontal wells from one surface location so that we don't have to disturb the surface multiple places uh, around this, this gas field. So again, the technology just continues to improve. Well, and that's what I was leading to, uh, and I appreciate your clarifying my questionable question, because this is something where I'm, I'm still learning what you've spent a lifetime uh, knowing. You've got less exposure to the watershed because you're going down less times for the total amount you're getting. Correct. Your, uh, your, your risk, of course, always is when you first drill through uh, a water area until you get it sealed and you're comfortable and all the tests have done, there's always some risk let's just say hypothetically, that you hit oil because some, one of the occasions there is oil much closer than you thought it would be. But you've eliminated all that risk before you start going horizontal. So in a sense, horizontal is getting more from this already mitigated small risk that you had when you first drilled what I guess uh, in Oklahoma is, what is it, 1.2 million wells they've drilled or something? We've drilled a lot of wells and fracked 100,000 of them in Oklahoma. Um, but also, the, uh, the, 
The other point I would make too, Congressman, is that in these shale plays in particular, which is really the revolutionary thing now, um, once we are this there. This is heavy, by the way. I, yeah, anyone that didn't pick this up, when I send it back down, you've got to figure, this is pretty darn dense rock. It's pretty amazing that we're, we're actually getting the gas to migrate through that rock to the wellbore. And, and what I was going to say is that also, um, when we are doing this in these shale plays, it almost becomes a, in those particular areas, something that we can replicate with less and less, almost zero risk. Of course, there's always some. But I think in the Barnett Shale, I don't think we've had a dry hole um, in thousands of wells for Devon. But that's because we've finally nailed this technology. It's right to your point that, that it's American ingenuity, it's innovation, trying to put these things together in different ways in these different shale plays. Now I'm, I'm going to only have about two more questions, but they're going to probably be ambiguous. So steer me through to the right answer on the questionable question. When you used to go down and try to find a pocket of gas, methane, et cetera, et cetera, all the combinations of what you'd find down there. It was hide-and-go-seek, and when you found it, it could be quite a surprise. There was a risk because this is volatile. You don't know what pressure you're going to poke into and so on. You're out of that business for the most part. You're going into a low pressure, di uh, you know, into rock rather than into a big pocket of gas with this technology. Isn't that true? Well, the pressures do vary. There are some high pressure areas and, and lower pressure areas. And I would say, too, that, that uh, as was mentioned earlier, along with the, the improvement in the completion techniques, the, the fracking and the drilling of the wells, we have had very significant and continue to have very significant uh, seismic and geophysics uh, type of technology improvements. And again, it's putting all that together so that we know where we're going to find uh, resources more accurately and we can drill fewer wells to find them have more success. But the reason I ask that question is, like most people who don't know your technology, be watch TV, I, I had watched uh, some years ago about what happens if you, if you hit that pocket and you shatter the impermeable layer that had kept it there for a long time. You can, in fact, have natural gas flowing freely to the surface. And that has happened a few times in history, at least enough for television to capture it. In the case of this technology, you're going through the impermeable layer, through the sand that was already there, back into the core rock that had not released it. So in a sense, it's a much safer operation because you're not, you're not up against, if you will, the great protection against gas free flowing up. It's much safer, and it's much safer for other reasons as well, which is that our, our materials and our processes and our practices are so much better today as we've learned through the years because of the very incidents that you've talked about. Now, one last question for you, and then Rock's got an answer for a question that I asked earlier, I think. Uh, this is a heck of a solid piece of rock. I looked at your presentation, and as I look at you going diagonally here and then there, I get the feeling that there's no question, you're releasing more than otherwise was released. Is there available technology or available percentage you could give me? What did we used to get when we just caught what happened to have bubbled up and was sitting there under the, the withholding chamber? What are we getting today when you frack typically? And how much is really down there if you continue to improve your fracking to where you can sort of get it all? Well, I don't know how to answer the first part of the question uh, in a global sense, but if you look at that one slide, there's a very dramatic representation from one area. But I will say that the Potential Gas Committee, and these are the, the resource estimators that are the experts in this country and really known worldwide, they've just come out with yet another uh, estimate of more natural gas that's recoverable in this country, something on the order of probably in North America, 2,500 trillion cubic feet. And we use 20 trillion or so uh, a year now. So you can see it's well more than 100 years. It continues to grow with technology. And that's got to be exciting for the country. Well, certainly for those of us who heard that we were going to get our last drop of oil or our last drop of gas, and we were going to need renewables already because it was all going to be gone, to find out that there's plenty more uh, and obviously I'm excited about oil because I don't want us importing oil from unfriendly areas. But I'm even more excited about natural gas because all the green lobbyists who have ever come to see me, and many have, they all talk about how if we could just get off that dirty coal, 
and get on to clean natural gas, what the benefit would be, thank you for what your company is doing to take us from X carbon per BTU to a fraction of what it would be if we go from coal to natural gas. And, Rock, you get the last answer to that question. Well, I just wanted to mention another application of the directional drilling, and that is offshore California. Uh, offshore production is a very emotional issue on the West Coast, but I wanted people to be cognizant of the fact that you can utilize this technology offshore California.